Okay, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's joining us. Um, we are delighted to be here today discussing the forgotten half of the planet, which is the high seas. And we are um, extremely grateful to have a slot in the IUCN's Global Youth Summit. And because of essentially where the planet is currently, we are just coming out or still in the midst of a horrific pandemic, of course, and suddenly our thoughts are on how we should be thinking about, you know, building back as a result of that and thinking about stemming the issues that sort of led to this pandemic as well. And so in order to restore nature um, and um, put ourselves more on a track that where we should be heading in terms of sustainability, we are unable to do that without considering our ocean and especially the largest part of the ocean, the high seas. So our high seas are a massive reservoir of astounding biodiversity, everything from tiny plankton and bacteria to massive whales, sharks, tunas, seabirds, turtles, and more. And of course, that's just in the surface layer, but there's also the staggering habitats and species of the deep ocean, seamounts that dwarf the tallest mountains on land, 30 meter high chimneys that gush superheated and chemical rich fluid that powers ecosystems in the deep sea, um, and even some of the oldest animals on the planet, glass sponges and deep sea corals that can live for thousands upon thousands of years. And the high seas, apart from just having this incredible life and these incredible habitats, they are integral to the functioning of our planet and our survival. They supply us with oxygen that we breathe, they store carbon and heat, regulating our planet's climate. And of course, we depend on the high seas for millions of tons of food every year and thousands of jobs. And we crisscross these waters, transporting 90% of world trade. And they are of cultural importance and provide unending inspiration. So really, this is a part of the planet that despite the fact that many of us think we don't interact with it, actually, it directly affects our lives in every way. So today we're kicking off chatting about the ongoing negotiations at the United Nations that are working towards a treaty, the High Seas Treaty, that will govern, manage and protect the majority of the ocean. And this first session, which is spread over today and tomorrow, organized by the Pew Charitable Trust, the High Seas Alliance, and the Arctic Youth Network, aims to empower youth, everyone who's hopefully joining us, and many, many more, in high seas governance. So my name is Diva Amon, and I'm a marine biologist that specializes in the deep ocean, and I've worked extensively on the high seas. And today we're being joined by an incredible panel, Inga Banshakova, Nicola Clark, Sebastian Nichols, and Pooja Tilvawala, who will be telling us about the High Seas Treaty and why it matters to us as well as to the planet. So these four speakers are gonna open up the session, telling us a little bit about these topics. And then we're gonna, after about roughly halfway, we're gonna stop and jump into some really, what I hope will be very interactive discussion. And so throughout the, the speaker's talks, please do submit any questions you may have, any comments you may have in the chat, and we will certainly get to them during and after everyone's talks. So with that, um, we're gonna start with a bit of a video, um, just to give us a little bit of an intro into the High Seas and the High Seas Treaty. Sebastian, would you mind playing that for us? International marine celebrities like blue whales, dolphins, and oceanic white tip sharks thrive in the open ocean that lies outside the boundaries of any country. It's called the high seas. It's almost two thirds of our ocean. It provides 90% of the habitat available for oceanic life on earth. But only about one half of 1% of the high seas are fully protected from fishing, mining, and other human pressures. That's just not working. So delegates and ocean advocates from over a hundred nations met this past September at the United Nations to start negotiating a treaty that will expand conservation of the high seas. This treaty will be the first legally binding agreement for the high seas in over two decades. 
Individual countries control what happens in the ocean within 200 miles of their shorelines. But beyond 200 miles, the high seas are a badly regulated commons. There's a patchwork of organizations managing these waters that don't collaborate. And it makes for big gaps in regulation across huge swaths of the ocean. Because humans have polluted and depleted our coastal areas, we've had to move our ocean activities further and further from shore. This means that the massive high seas, once thought to be immune to harm, are now seriously threatened by overfishing, climate change, plastic and noise pollution, illegal dumping, shipping traffic, habitat loss, and seabed mining. Three billion people worldwide depend on oceans for their livelihood. But just like the ocean, many humans working on the high seas aren't sufficiently protected. Human trafficking, slave labor, and human rights abuses abound on the multinational, moving landscape of the high seas. Things are pretty urgent. And this is a once in a generation opportunity to protect the ocean and all life that depends on it, including us. Marine protected areas shelter fragile and vulnerable ocean life from mining, drilling, fishing, and other damaging activity. They also boost abundance and healthier fish populations that benefit people who depend on oceans for food and jobs. But so far, fully safeguarded MPAs have been a near impossibility in international waters, and this needs to be addressed by the treaty. Scientists have also found that marine protected areas are crucial to maintaining resilience in the face of rapid ocean warming and acidification from climate change. The world's oceans absorb one quarter of the excess carbon dioxide that humans produce, and more than 90% of the excess heat from climate change. But we barely protect any of the ocean on paper, and less in practice. If you care about your fellow Earthlings or about stopping climate change, it's impossible to overstate the role oceans play in this fight. We just can't provide a climate resilient ocean to the next generation, nor resilient ocean economies, without actively protecting the high seas. Half the planet is at stake in this fight. But that also means that we have the chance to help shape the future of that half of the planet together. Let's do it. Great, thank you. And a huge thanks to one of our panelists, Pooja, who, you know, pointed out that incredible NRDC video, which really sort of sums up and is a wonderful introduction to us, to this session. Um, so um, our first talk is going to be from Inga Banshakova. Uh, Inga is the organizer of the Oceans Working Group, which is a part of the Arctic Youth Network. She's a Fulbright scholar and a master's student at Oregon State University. And she is an assistant in the World Wild Fund, Wildlife Fund's Arctic team. Um, her research interests include international environmental law and policy, especially in the Arctic region. And her main topics tend to be shipping, marine protected areas, and the Arctic Ocean overall. So, Inga, with that, would you like to take it away? Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to see you all on this uh, Global Youth Summit. So I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, so uh, sorry. Yeah. So I'm going to start with a kind of kindergarten question. Uh, how many oceans are there? Uh, and the answer is simpler than it seems. Uh, there is only one. And um, like, it seems strange, but do I mean that these guys are really neighbors? Canadian narwhal and green turtle, which uh, is typical to tropical waters. And uh, actually they are. Uh, there are five ocean basins, but uh, in general, we have only one ocean. And uh, though the, uh, the rest is geographically divided into these distinct name uh, regions with boundaries, uh, the vast body of water covers 71% uh, of uh, the Earth, and this is all interconnected. And if you are not um, impressed by the global ocean already, there are some quick facts about the ocean. That the ocean serve uh, as the world's largest source of protein, and three billion people depend on the oceans uh, as their primary source of it. 
uh, it absorbs about 30% of carbon dioxide uh, and produced by humans. Uh, and about 44% of the world's population lives within 150 kilometers of the ocean. So the ocean is the kind of planetary superpower, uh, home to spectacular ecosystem, treasured wildlife, uh, and it regulates our climate, produces half the oxygen we breathe, and fuels uh, the water cycle uh, that produces rain and fresh water. Uh, and uh, to be able to govern this superpower, we need the international ocean governance. It's about managing and using the world's ocean and its resources in a way that keeps it healthy, productive, safe, secure, and resound. At least it should be like this. Uh, the main organization concerned with this is uh, United Nations, and the main document is the uh, 1982 United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and you all know that. It's the overarching treaty uh, for managing humans' activities in the ocean. The resolution created on clause uh, was the Yunga Resolution 2750, and it explicitly recognizes the interdependence of people, ocean life, economics, politics, science, and technology and emphasize that all must be considered as a whole within the framework of close international cooperation. Uh, the rights of coastal states uh, to regulate and exploit areas of the ocean under their jurisdiction are one, uh, the foundations of the law of the sea. And these rights need to be balanced with the freedom of navigation and access to resources outside the state control, the freedom of the seas. Law of the Sea permits coastal states to establish several different maritime zones, and you see them on the, see them on the screen. Uh, maritime zones are drawn using the, uh, what the Law of the Sea calls baselines. These zones are measured using nautical miles, a measurement based on the circumference of the Earth. So uh, as you see on the screen, there are six types of these zones, and what we are mostly interested in right now are the high seas and the deep uh, ocean floor. Here is the scheme. Uh, you, can, you can see what uh, is where. Uh, basically, we will uh, just explain the high seas perspective using the um, exclusive economic zones and their difference. So generally, they are extended to uh, 100 nautical miles from coastal baselines and encompass less than 40% of the ocean surface. While at the same time, the high seas, or you can call them bounding main, international waters, uh, or areas beyond national jurisdiction, which will be commonly used in this presentation. They cover about 60% of our Earth, and uh, they re refer to the open ocean, not within the territorial waters or jurisdiction of any state. There is an uh, official definition of the high seas and coast, uh, and you see the, it on the screen. All This is all part, parts of the sea that are not included in the exclusive economic zone in the territorial sea, or in the internal waters of state, or in the amphipolite waters of amphipolite state. Uh, the high seas are the international waters covering uh, over two thirds of our ocean, as you have seen from the video, and they are owned uh, by everyone and no one at the same time. They are frequently referred to uh, as global commons, and global commons are hybrid between uh, private goods and uh, public goods. They are non rivalous in their consumption, but scarce, and they have a finite supply. So that's why they are susceptible to free riding and overuse. And this uh, issue called issue of the commons has been one of the central concepts uh, in environmental studies in the 19th century. And if you remember the strategy of the commons by Hardin, uh, that uh, global commons are tend to be overexploited and overused. What else is that, uh, according to UNCLOS, uh, high seas provide several freedoms, freedom of navigation, of overflight, freedom to lay submarine cables and pipelines, freedom to construct artificial islands and other installations permitted under international law, freedom of fishing, freedom of scientific research. This is the article 87 of UNCLOS. At the same time, the convention says that uh, the high seas shall be reserved for peaceful purposes, whatever it means. Uh, it is known that the high seas are one of the largest reservoirs of biodiversity on Earth. Many marine species such as whales, tunas, and sharks spend much of their lives uh, on the high seas. They migrate along the highways and byways of the great ocean basins. Uh, other species spend their entire lives on the high seas, 
uh, they live in there, breeding, uh, and, and go back again. Other species um, are not even uh, discovered yet. Uh, it, uh, it is known that only like 1,000 of percent of the deep sea floor has so far been studied. And it estimates that uh, millions of species living there are yet to be found. So this is the great biodiversity um, treasure on Earth. Uh, what else is that this water is also called an astonishing variety of microscopes, big organisms and phytoplankton that produce almost half of the water's oxygen supply. The high seas provide critical ecosystem services for our planet, uh, from fisheries to climate uh, regulation. And uh, with the world population reaching 9, uh, 10 billion by 2050, uh, pressures on the ocean are expected to increase. And global competition uh, on, for raw materials, food, water will become more intense, while illegal fishing, piracy, climate change, and marine pollution are already threatening our ocean health. Uh, and these areas belong to everyone, yet governments currently have no comprehensive legal mechanism to place uh, in, in place to protect these areas. And increasing impacts from human activity continue to negatively affect biodiversity on the high seas. For instance, over the past 50 years, uh, stocks of tuna and other highly migratory species uh, such uh, as marlin and uh, mackerel have declined on average by 60%. This is, uh, this is insane. Uh, new and emerging unregulated activities are adding another layer of uh, problem here. And uh, that's why we are now trying to do anything which will influence the status quo. And this presentation and this summit in general is uh, our contribution right now. So I, I'm passing the word to the next panel. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you, Inga. I mean, I think what we just heard from Inga is, you know, how absolutely important our high seas are. And the fact that there is this really major concern currently that potentially we may be seeing, you know, the tragedy of the commons coming to bear. But actually, we're going to hear from Nicola now, Nicola Clark, who's going to tell us a bit about how this high seas treaty would help to avoid that situation. So Nicola is an officer on the protecting ocean life on the high seas team at the Pew Charitable Trust. And there, her, one of her main roles is following the negotiations for the new high seas treaty. High seas treaty. Nicola is also wearing multiple hats. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Wollongong's Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security, ANCORS, where her research is focusing on area-based management tools and institutional arrangements for the BBNJ High Seas Agreement. She is particularly interested in thinking about how the BBNJ Agreement will interact with existing regional and sectoral organizations without undermining them, as we saw in that introductory video and heard from Inga. And prior to ANCORS and Pew, Nicola worked on international fisheries at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, and also on deep seas and high seas research at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Germany. So Nicola is gonna tell us a bit about the BBNJ Treaty, which she is so familiar. Nicola, take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction, Diva. Um, and let me just go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you again for the introduction. It's wonderful to be with you all today, um, where I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the High Seas Treaty, but the, the sort of second half of today's panel will go into a lot more detail. So this is really just a teaser for what's going to happen later today. I'll start out with a very brief reminder of why we need a High Seas Treaty in the first place. The core issue, the problem, as it were, is that there are several critical governance gaps on the high seas. It's a fragmented puzzle of organizations that manage different aspects of human activities in different areas on the high seas with varying degrees of effectiveness. And they don't do a great job of coordinating with each other. And in this messy patchwork approach to high seas governance, key things have slipped through the gaps. Namely, there's no legal mechanism to establish comprehensive marine protected areas on the high seas. And there's also no global obligation to conduct environmental impact assessments for activities that are taking place there. 
And this problem on the high seas is magnified by their vast scale. The high seas make up two thirds of the ocean and cover almost half of the planet's surface. So on this map uh, to the right, all of those areas in dark blue, space are the high seas. And of course, high seas ecosystems are inextricably linked to those in coastal waters. So the stakes really are high for the High Seas Treaty. It will impact most of the ocean, its life, and by extension, the services a healthy ocean ecosystem provides. And finally, I don't know how many of you have heard about this initiative to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. Um, if you're not very familiar, you will be by the end of our next speaker, um, Sebastian, who will tell you a little bit more about that initiative. Um, but it's this goal to, it's a protection target that scientists tell us we need to achieve if we want to maintain a healthy functioning ocean and planet, and there's several governments that have signed on to support this goal. But the high seas have a really important role to play in achieving a 30% ocean protection target because, well, just the numbers, right? It's two thirds of the ocean. Um, and then also the connectivity because it's so connected to the rest of the ocean. But unfortunately, only about 1% of the high seas are protected. And really all of that actually comes from one massive marine protected area in the Antarctic, the South Ocean, the, South, the Ross Sea in PA, uh, which is a special case legally and, and biologically speaking. So um, the United Nations have been talking about a possible high seas treaty for over 15 years, closer to 20 now at this point. Um, in 2004, United Nations decision makers began to acknowledge that these high seas ocean areas need stronger protections and that they needed comprehensive management. Um, so over the next 14 years, the United Nations met to discuss these issues with increasing levels of formality. Um, at first uh, in an informal working group way and then a more, prep, more formal preparatory committee. Um, and then finally, in December of 2017, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution that officially launched an intergovernmental conference to negotiate this new treaty to protect the high seas. So after a long and winding road, the fourth and final meeting of the negotiations was supposed to take place in March of 2020, but was postponed because of the pandemic. Um, so it's now due to take place um, August of 2021. And in case anybody wanted to see what it looks like in the room of the negotiations, um, the room where it happens, as it were, that's a picture from the first round of negotiations. The second round, we changed rooms. It was very exciting. Um, and then third round, the same changed room. Um, so um, in case anybody needs a refresher on acronyms, because there are quite a lot when we talk about this, um, we sometimes refer to the High Seas Treaty as the BB&J Treaty. And BB&J stands for um, Marine Biological Diversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, BB&J. And the BB&J Treaty's core objective is the conservation and sustainable use of, BB of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Um, but it's also charged with considering a, a package of issues, marine genetic resources, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, and capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. Um, and then in addition to sort of these four package elements that the treaty has to cover, there also is, there's also a whole bunch of what we call cross-cutting issues. So different issues that cut across all of these different package elements. And I really do think that one of the most exciting things about this new treaty is that if it's successful, if it's done right, um, it would provide a legal mechanism by which we could actually establish marine protected areas on the high seas. And we could finally start giving these areas the meaningful protection that they need and deserve. In case anybody is curious and wants to learn a little bit more about these areas um, or, or learn more about what's been said during the negotiations themselves, um, well, you can contact me, I'll, I'll share my email at the end. Um, but also if you wanna do more digging on your own, uh, feel free to go to the, the official website, um, the United Nations for BBNJ, where you can see the draft treaty text, see what the text looks like, take a look at what countries have submitted um, for their positions on different elements of the treaty. There's also the Environmental News Bulletin, which is a sort of news reporting service that, that has gone to all of the meetings and provides reports. Really cool photos. All of the photos that I'm using from the room are, are from ENB. Um, and then there's the High Seas Alliance, um, which my organization Pew is a part of. We've been going to, the HSA has been going to these meetings almost since the beginning. We've got a, a treaty tracker where we sort of have, have made note of the different interventions. And so you can search for who said what, either by, by country or by topic. 
Um, and then also uh, my organization, the Pew Charitable Trusts, has been engaged in these issues for a number of years, and we've done a lot of a lot of research and analysis on these issues. So you can go to our website to find a number of different issue briefs and analysis. So youth voices have been conspicuously absent from the BB&J negotiations. You can see from these pictures, there are a couple of maybe youngish people. I'm, I'm in one of those pictures when I was youngish, um, but there, there are a number of groups that are trying to change that. And tomorrow we're gonna be showcasing them in more detail. So I would really encourage you to come back to tomorrow's session where we'll, we'll showcase them. Um, but this treaty is a once in a generation opportunity to change the way we manage and govern our global ocean. The success of this treaty is not guaranteed, but it will dramatically affect the future health of our ocean, our planet and people. And the time to act is now before we finally end negotiations for the treaty. This treaty affects your future and your voice deserves to be, deserves to be heard. Um, and so I'd really encourage you to get involved um, either within the, the High Seas Alliance, we've got an Arctic Youth um, Ambassadors Program and are looking to engage youth in other ways. Um, come tomorrow to hear more about that. Similarly, the Arctic Youth Network is doing a lot of cool things to engage youth. They'll talk a little bit about that today and even more about that tomorrow. And there are other organizations as well that again, I hope you'll come back and, and learn from. We also would encourage you all to participate in the Youth Speak Labs at this Global Youth Summit. Um, and if you're so uh, inclined, we would, we would hope that you might think about um, calling for the outcome document uh, to include a call for a strong high seas treaty. Um, so with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to, to get in touch with me if you have any, any questions or comments. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to, to Diva and the next speaker. Thank you so much, Nicola. I mean, yes, it's certainly a compelling case that this is something that we cannot miss this opportunity. And it's also intrinsically, as Nicola started to tell us, linked to more marine protected areas on the high seas. So to tell us a little bit more about that, we're gonna welcome Sebastian Nichols to, to the floor. Sebastian is a senior associate on the Protecting Ocean Life on the High Seas team at Pew Charitable Trust, where he supports the team's regional engagement, research and capacity building efforts so that eventually the High Seas Treaty text enables meaningful protection of the high seas itself. So prior to joining Pew, Sebastian worked on marine protected area policy and advocacy with the Marine Conservation Institute and supported philanthropic organizations focused on marine environmental issues. Sebastian also serves on the board of directors of the International Ocean Film Festival and previously served on the board of organizations focused on youth advocacy and electric vehicle adoption in California. So Sebastian, would you like to take the floor please? Thank you, Diva. Um, let me get my presentation sorted here. All right, so as Nicola started talking about, there's a global initiative to protect at least 30% of the ocean by 2030. And also, Sebastian, uh, we can see, sorry, we can see you in presenter mode. Let me try that again. Full screen now. All right. Um, well, as Nicola mentioned, there's a global push to protect 30% of the ocean by 2030. This is known as 30 by 30. And I'll talk about how the high seas are a crucial part of that solution. So uh, both Nicola and Inga alluded to this already, but in terms of ocean areas, there's very little of the ocean that's already protected. In the blue sections here of this graph, there's the EZ. Lighter blue is EZs, national jurisdictions that are unprotected. Darker blue, EZs that are under some level of protection. The large green slice is the high seas that are unprotected. And the tiny sliver is the high seas that are protected. So less or around 1% of the high seas are protected, fully protected, it's less than that. But it's really underrepresented in the total solution. And this is important, not just because we have a long way to go to get to 30% of the ocean protected. As Nicola mentioned, it's mathematically 
uh, <laughs> difficult to get there without the high seas, almost impossible. Um, but also because of what the 30% protected needs to have to deliver those benefits that Nicola alluded to. So there's a lot of science backing this 30% minimum target of uh, how much of the ocean needs to be protected to ensure critical ecosystem functions. Um, these include providing food security, protecting biodiversity, uh, ensuring the sustainability of fisheries, and um, satisfying different stakeholders. There's six core functions that different studies have found require at least 30% of the ocean protected so that the ocean can continue to function and provide those benefits into the future. And this is why the NGO uh, community and um, many nations at this point, 75 different nations have committed to protecting at least 30% of a global ocean by 2030. But to deliver those benefits, the 30% can't just be anywhere. It has to be ecologically representative, it has to contribute to ecological connectivity, and it has to be well managed and enforced. As you saw from the first graph, the high seas are currently underrepresented in the protected area coverage in the ocean. And this leaves <coughs> species like the deep sea coral and crinoid in this picture uh, lacking in protection relative to more coastal species. Um, because most of the deep ocean lies in the high seas, a network of MPAs that excludes the high seas cannot be ecologically representative. And so there's a real necessity to include that. Furthermore, for the well-managed portion of the marine protected areas, um, the current patchwork of organizations that provides Is everyone else still with me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think we have Sebastian's dropped out temporarily. Um, so we'll just wait a 10, uh, not a 10 minutes, that would be way too long. Uh, we'll just wait for 10 seconds. And if anything, um, we'll switch over to Pooja and wait, and then Sebastian can finish up once he's resolved that. Pooja would, um, would that be something that you're yes, happy to work with? Okay, great. Um, yes, I see he's totally dropped out the call now. Um, so with that, we're just gonna jump onto Pooja and then we'll come back to Sebastian. Um, so Pooja is going to tell us about why the high seas is so integral to our climate. So Pooja Tilvala, Tilvawala sorry, was born in India, but she grew up in the United States. In 2018, she graduated from American University in Washington, D.C. with degrees in economics and international studies, specializing in justice, ethics, and human rights. And after graduating, Pooja worked on several ocean and climate-related projects at the Meridian Institute and now works for the Kenne Bunkport Climate Initiative as a youth network strategic consultant. And as their first climate career winner, Pooja started the Youth Climate Collaborative, which makes it easier for youth to get involved and remain involved in environmental and climate work and fosters meaningful collaboration with youth, which is obviously something that is absolutely essential given to what we are talking about in the forum we are in here today. Um, and Pooja, I mean, again, talking about wearing hats, different hats, she also volunteers to several organizations, including the High Seas Alliance, the World Bank, Youth Global Climate Network, UNA USA, Huge NGO, and COI 16, a whole bunch of acronyms. So with that, Pooja, please take it away. Thanks so much for that introduction. So today, right now, we're gonna talk about climate change and our oceans. Uh, my slide is not, has the slide switched now? Yes, great, okay. Yeah. So Diva just gave the introduction, so I'm gonna, skip over this slide. But within the Youth Climate Collaborative, we have three key initiatives right now. One is an eco action map where you can go onto our website, which is youthcc.org, create an account, and then post different opportunities that youth can get involved in. So job opportunities, uh, mentorship, and a whole bunch of other ones. And you yourself can find organizations that are near you that you can get involved in. Um, and then we have climate courage workshops, which are to help youth build their emotional resilience to working in the climate change and environmental 
uh, spaces. And then our Youth Allies Initiative is to try and get youth voices at various decision-making spaces. So that's a brief overview. Now, I saw this cool quote um, when I was uh, doing some research for this presentation. So how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean by Arthur C. Clarke. So <laughs> I thought it was very interesting um, and I hadn't thought about this before where really our ocean is, I mean, our world is mostly ocean. And so I thought that was interesting. Um, now, as Sebastian was uh, detailing in his presentation, we rely on the ocean for medicine and minerals, food, our livelihood, energy and minerals, protection, oxygen, and heat and carbon storage. So today I'm first gonna talk about uh, the ocean and its ability to help absorb and store carbon. So this picture right here is of the biological carbon pump that the ocean has. And so did you know that overall there is 60 times more carbon in the ocean than the atmosphere above it? And did you know that 50 to 80% of our oxygen is produced by the ocean? The biological reason is because the surface waters are home to phytoplankton, which are microscopic marine plants that photosynthesize to produce oxygen. This process is crucial to remember because it also captures carbon dioxide and stores it in the ocean, making the ocean an enormous carbon sink. In fact, over one third of the carbon ever produced by humans has been stored in the ocean. This happens when the carbon absorbed by phytoplankton at the surface sinks into deeper waters when the plankton die or are eaten by larger creatures. As human encroachment and pollution have dominated, they have destroyed many of the natural protections for coastal communities, including mangrove forests, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows. Um, the seagrass meadows can capture and store carbon at a rate of 35 times faster than pristine tropical forests, which I didn't know earlier. Yet we've lost over half of our mangrove forests worldwide. Now, contrary to what you might think, much of the carbon absorbed at the surface is actually stored in deeper waters in sediments in the seabed where it can remain for hundreds or thousands of years. The carbon is sequestered in the deep cold waters. By absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, over the past two centuries, ocean acidification has increased by 30%, threatening marine life up and down the food chain. Now, the second quality of our ocean is that it helps regulate the world's temperatures through ocean heat uptake. And so essentially the ocean is a sponge that takes in heat. In the last 50 years, about 93% of all the heat trapped by greenhouse gases have been absorbed by the ocean. In fact, without the ocean to buffer and protect us, the world would be 35 degrees hotter than it is right now. That's crazy, I'm just gonna say that again. The world would be 35 degrees hotter than it is right now if we didn't have our oceans to protect us. But all this heat storage comes at a cost. Um, as sea temperatures rise, millions of marine creatures are suffering. Coral reefs are in particular badly affected by rising sea temperatures, um, uh, which causes coral bleaching. Uh, which has meant that in the last 30 years, the world has lost over 50% of its coral reefs. Now, what are we doing about it? Um, currently, only 5% of the world's ocean is properly protected with many marine protected areas receiving limited management and only half of 1% of the high seas are protected at the moment. Um, now, scientists have suggested that to make a difference, we need to protect at least 30% of our ocean and do so with proper management measures. This is where the BBNJ treaty comes in too. It would help us protect the high seas, which make up 64% of our ocean. But if we were to take action for ocean recovery, we could build back better by meeting a fifth of the emissions reductions needed to achieve our goal of limiting global heating to one and a half degrees. 
And that's not even considering the co-benefits like protection from storms, cleaner seas, or protecting our ocean's incredible biodiversity. Um, these are just some sources that I used. MIT, WWF, Pew Charitable Trust, shout out, uh, Ocean Climate Platform and NOAA. And now for Youth Climate Collaborative, as a youth, if you're interested in getting involved, you can uh, scan this QR code on your phone. It has a cute little dinosaur um, where you can visit uccc.org or email me at puja at uccc.org. We're going to have our platform launch party um, between May 7th and 9th. So be on the lookout for that. I'm gonna turn it back over to Diva now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Puja. Um, so just to wrap up our talks, we're gonna throw it very, very quickly back to Sebastian, and then we're gonna dive into our discussion. So please do submit your questions in the chat box. But Sebastian, if you're there and you're willing, we'd love to have the rest of your talk. We can see your slides full screen, so you're good. Um, sorry, now it was uh, muted. Okay, so I think I was up this slide and talking about how uh, representation matters for the 30% to achieve those benefits, including the ones that Pooja just talked about. It needs to be ecologically representative, connected, and well-managed, and since most of the a uh, deep ocean lies in the high seas. A network of marine protected areas that covers 30% can't be ecologically representative, including um, species such as the steep sea coral and crinoid in the image without including the deep seas. And because of the patchwork of organizations that don't have comprehensive management over the high seas, a high seas treaty is critical for that the, third, the part of the 30% that ends up lying in the high seas, those protected areas in the high seas, to deliver all the benefits with effective management. So what might protecting the high seas look like? Um, on this slide, I have an image of a map um, created by a study uh, that Pew Charitable Trust supported with the University of California, Santa Barbara, that identified uh, areas of the high seas that are particularly valuable for biodiversity and for the benefits they provide. There are a variety of factors that were considered in coming up with this, but the kind of main headline is not all um, ocean areas and not all high seas areas are equal. So planning where those protected areas lie is uh, particularly important to deliver those benefits that a 30% protection of the ocean can get us to. And um, you know, with the map, you can get an idea of what a first generation of high seas protected areas, if we can get an ambitious high seas treaty done in the next couple of years that enables meaningful protections, might actually look like protecting areas as diverse as Costa Rica Dome. That's a kind of convergence of currents that creates unique, uh, unique um, biodiversity um, reservoirs there and sea mounts that uh, Diva has talked about as mountains that might be as tall as mountains on land or more, but are just below the surface. So just to kind of close the circle, I'll say protection is possible for most of human history. Activities in the high seas were either too expensive or too uh, dangerous and accessible, making most of the high seas a de facto very large marine protected area. So we can protect it again. What's at stake is uh, you know, species that haven't been discovered and species that have been discovered, like the Dumbo octopus pictured at the top and below there's a type D killer whale that was first documented uh, it, with photographic evidence in 2019 that lives in subantarctic waters. So there's life big and small that remains to be discovered in the high seas if we can protect them in time. And it's really urgent to get there and get to 30% of the global ocean protected and in, including the high seas so that we can keep the opportunity to discover those species. So I'll close out with that. Uh, this final slide is a picture of a deep sea coral uh, Metallogorgia melanotrichus with a brittle star uh, Phyocrius oedipus. These species live together one star to one coral wherever they're found on seamounts between the depths of um, 1300 meters to 2200 meters. 
They were initially found in New Zealand, but have been found on, on seamounts as far as the corner rise in the North Atlantic that's in the high seas. And so this really shows the connection, the fragility, the types of beautiful stories that we might be able to find more of if we can get to that 30% of the ocean protected, including high seas areas. That's it. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, so I think that's a great segue into the first question that I wanted to throw to all the panelists. Um, you know, given how vast the high seas is and the incredible um, habitats, species, behaviors, et cetera, et cetera, that, that are found there, um, if you could potentially protect, um, what would be your highest priority area on the high seas to protect, in your opinion? So Sebastian, do you want to start? I know you have like extensive experience with this. <laughs> so the most important areas of the high seas to protect? Yeah, so in your, I mean, in your opinion, if you could just turn around tomorrow and say, we're gonna protect here, what would it be? I think the, the Pew study that Nicola was more involved in than I uh, does a really good job of identifying those, those areas that are most important. Uh, because biodiversity is under such uh, really multiplying threats from overfishing, climate change, uh, potentially seabed mining, protecting areas that are rich in biodiversity is particularly important. Um, I think that one of the habitats that's most important for biodiversity and underrepresented currently in marine protected areas is seamounts, uh, these deep sea mountains that uh, contribute to the way currents fluctuate and make the ocean above them also much more productive, but can host incredible sea life uh, like deep sea corals um, that can live thousands of years, uh, but have evolved to uh, be in a very um, small range of temperatures that might be at risk with climate change and so are at particular risk uh, from climate change. But I'm gonna punt it over to Nicola to talk more about which areas are most important to be protected. And Pooja and Inga, I hope you have some answers lined up too, because we're coming to you next. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian and Diva. Yeah, a fabulous question. And and Sebastian, I would I would actually answer very similarly to how to how you did. Um, so yeah, I think you know just in term in general terms, I, I I agree. I think looking at those seamounts and sea vents in the high seas are just home to such vast um, uh, ecosystems of really endemic species. Right. And and we honestly we we don't know what what potential like we know that there's a lot of value. There are a number of unknown species that are in the high seas. Um, and we know that especially the endemic ones lie um, in particular around these these seamounts and vents. Although, you know, Diva, you're the scientist who's gone to some of these seamounts and vents. So you you can tell a lot about, more about those some of the incredible species that are there. Um, but yeah, in addition to sort of protecting the endemic species in in those vent and, and mount areas, um, you know, I would also look to uh, areas that are particularly important stepping stones along migratory routes for some of these important um, uh, species, you know, whales, tunas, um, turtles, etc. Um, and especially those that are sort of apex predators, right, and really important to the to the overall biodiversity food chain and, and ecosystem functioning. Um, and so, yeah, the we we sort of highlighted uh, ten ten per individual sites within the Pew report um, that met a lot of these criteria, right? They were looking for seamounts and sea vents and and areas of great biodiversity because they were important for you know um, feeding or or breeding grounds. Um, so yeah, I would encourage people to check out the the report itself, and you can do a little bit more digging on some of the just you know some of some of the the creme of the creme, the best of the best, the most incredible places um, on the high seas that that study found. Great, thank you. Inga, any thoughts, Pooja? I would just uh, take the innovation angle and say there's a lot of potential with algae and algal blooms, um, not just for like medicine, but for carbon capture. And so it'll be very interesting to see how that area of innovation progresses over time. Right, Inga? Sorry, Sebastian, go ahead. Sorry, just to add one more thing. I, I'd say, you know, the areas that are most important also depend on what your goals are with conservation. 
Um, so Pooja uh, mentioned the particular value of seagrass meadows uh, for carbon capture by area. They're a lot more efficient at taking carbon out than uh, terrestrial forests. And there's actually some high seas areas that have seagrass meadows and the mass green plateau. Um, but uh, back to Nicola's point, you can learn a lot more about some of these really unique uh, areas that deserve protection in the uh, high seas report. And we can share the link with participants. Great. Um, Inga, do you wanna do you wanna tell us a little more before we go on to the next question? I also agree that uh, it depends what uh, on what are the particular conservation goals. But I think in general, uh, we've been listing a lot of reasons why uh, these areas should be protected. And even if some of them doesn't fit in your like picture of the world, I think there will be um, anything that will uh, touch your heart because uh, I don't know, like people who don't care about the climate change, they, they can also care about the species and so on and so forth. And I think that this uh, problem is so multi-faced and uh, multi-sided that uh, I don't feel like there's anyone who could stay uh, indifferent towards this problem. I, I mean, um, maybe maybe you, you will say I'm wrong, but I have never met anyone who would say that, um, you know what, uh, I don't care about anything connected to the ocean protection. I mean, at least one re of the reasons would, uh, would fit. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that, but I think there is often a disconnect between uh, people saying it and then and then action, of course, which is what we're trying to change as a result of that session. So there's just been a, set, uh, a question that's come in from Nicole um, and she asks, how do we ensure that the governing body of the BBNG has real enforcement and authority to drive the treaty's success, given that with previous management on the high seas, there's not really been that aspect? Um, great question. Uh, does anyone want to tackle this one straight off the bat? I'll take a first crack at that. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> and then Inga, we'll go to you next after. Um, so, so just to say that there's um, a, a number of the countries who are uh, negotiating the treaty are, are negotiating for a pretty weak decision-making body, um, which I think is really problematic because I think to, to your excellent question, Nicole, I think if you have a weak decision-making body um, or a decentralized decision-making body, then, then you're going to likely see a lot of the dysfunction um, that you've seen in other bodies, right, replicated in bb &J, and that's certainly something that we, we don't want to see happen. So I think, you know, for us, it's really critical that you have a a strong global level decision making body that is empowered to do things like create an MPA, which, by the way, many countries are opposed to, which is crazy to me. Um, and and also to actually enforce that MPA, right? To have associated management measures, to have a, a compliance body um, that meets regularly and, and is a place where, um, where countries are sort of required to report back on their progress and where there are consequences, right? If they're not following um, their obligations under this new treaty. So I think um, having that, having that um, global level decision-making um, is going to be with with the powers to both establish an MPA, but also um, associated management measures and to enforce those measures is going to be really key to sort of overcoming some of the dysfunction we've seen in other bodies. Great, Inga. I'm going to throw it to um, Inga, and then we're going to jump onto one more question and then wrap things up. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I agree with what Nicola said, but I also want to mention that um, these negotiations were really different in case that countries were wanting to. Uh, exclude the reporting requirement from the treaty. And I think that this is really um, important for the treaty to be implemented and to be enforced, the reporting me mechanism uh, by which countries can report about their efforts, what they've done, and there will be like a commission or a body that will check on these achievements. And what uh, I also want to say is that uh, this question is this like broader, it's about the environmental treaty making and how to make a treaty successful and sustainable. And there is no uh, particular answer to this, but I think that first is that um, the body which will like make checks 
on, on what the countries will have done and there will should be like a kind of a system of punishment, a system of enforcement also and uh, transparency mechanism and uh, the scientific body that will ensure that we have the latest uh, information that uh, exists in the world. And I also want to say that look at this example of Montreal Protocol. I think that um, the greatest achievement is that the treaty is changing while the situation is changing. Like the new science appears, then they renegotiate the treaty. And I think that this is important to BBNJ as well, that uh, the treaty won't be um, stable in one position, that it could be flexible and it could be changing throughout the time uh, according to the new science arising. Great, thank you, Inga. Um, so I think, you know, that really points to the fact that we, if unless things are in for, have a way to enforce things, then it will just be words on a piece of paper. And that's something we really have to avoid. So I just want to wrap up throwing it to each panelist really quickly, just one or two sentences really briefly. Um, given, you know, we're here in a youth forum, given the next session um, that's coming up straight after this, how can we ensure that youth voices are heard? How can we ensure that youth have an impact on these negotiations? Pooja, do you want to go first? I know you spoke about this at length in your in your discussion. Yeah, sure. So I think one of the cool things that we're seeing happening are organizations that have been working on these issues for a while now are creating opportunities for youth to get involved in some capacity, like for the High Seas Alliance, where I'm an ambassador. They have this ambassador program where they're educating us about the high seas and the treaties, and then um, giving us a group of other youth who are passionate about this issue so we can work together to then create action and, and um, spread awareness about these issues. And then there's like UNA USA where they have global goals ambassadors programs. Um, and then um, what we do need to see a little bit more of, um, and the UN tries to do this where they have a lot of like leadership opportunities for youth where youth are given this position and they can kind of run with um, creating programs around um, ocean awareness. Um, and so having more like leadership opportunities, seed funding for youth to create programs and implement them. And then as like an everyday thing that youth can do to spread awareness is just have conversations with their friends, their peers, their parents about like what you learned today, for example, like you can go to your parents or friends and be like, hey, I just heard this cool talk about the High Seas Treaty. Did you know? And then you can, you know, spread awareness in that manner. Great. I think let's just take one more set of comments on this. Sebastian, Nicola, Inga, anyone? I'll, I'll take it if no one else is jumping out the bit. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, you said it there, it's up to us uh, in a way, Diva. So activism matters, engagement matters. Um, the High Seas Alliance has a lot of resources, briefs, if you want to get informed further. And then uh, youth <laughs> need to get organized to work together across uh, international lines and uh, engage in advocacy and reaching out to um, government delegates that are making these decisions and pushing uh, their individual governments to take a stronger stance, to be in favor of global decision-making, to push for the what's needed to be able to have protected areas um, on the high seas. Amazing. So with that, um, I'm going to thank all of our panelists, Sebastian, Nicola, Puja, and Inga um, for spending time with us today to discuss the high seas treaty. And I'm going to hand it over to the next session, which will be diving into the BBNJ and we're studying especially how can you study the process together and how can we empower youth engagement in this process. So again, thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to the High Seas Alliance, Pew Charitable Trust and the Arctic Youth Network. And with that, um, we will hand it over to Philip. Thank you, Diva. Uh, so um, let me just share my screen real quick. So can everybody see my screen? Okay, so uh, like you can see, we're gonna work on this on this part of the panel, uh, diving into the 
PBNG. So diving a little bit more into the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And um, we're gonna talk more about how can you study, uh, how can you study the process together and how, how to empower the youth engagement and uh, you know, we're going to see a lot of a lot of different, uh, actually six of different presentations. The first two presentations are going to be uh, the introduction to the um, uh, the introduction to the um, um, sorry, let me just change. Yeah, the intro to uh, Arctic Youth Network, and uh, Peter Halderson is going to talk about it, and uh, we're going to hear more about Arctic Youth Network, how they developed, uh, what did they do the subgroup now that's Arctic Youth Oceans. And uh, after that, uh, Mana uh, Tugend is gonna talk about Arctic uh, Youth Oceans and BBNJ. So it's gonna be also an interesting, really interesting talk uh, of how the Arctic Youth Oceans is actually working on the negotiations and some issues in negotiations of the BBNJ. Uh, then we're going to jump on four elements. Uh, they call we called it a four four pillars. So um, it, it's an issues uh, of in the in negotiations of the BBNJ. And um, uh, first we're going to have Rachel uh, Rachel Sullivan Lord. She's going to talk about marine genetic resources. Uh, then we're going to jump uh, to uh, Manon Sensor, and she's going to talk about area based management tools. Uh, afterwards, we're going to have environmental impact assessment presented by Katarina Heinrich. And last but not least is going to be the bride and bone who's going to focus more on capacity building and the transfer of, of marine technology. Um, let me just first real quick, I introduced the whole session, but I didn't introduce myself. My name is Philip Alimpich, and I'm also the member of the Arctic Youth Network. Uh, I'm an uh, environmental protection analyst, uh, currently uh, living in Serbia. Uh, I did some research uh, uh, through my uh, short-term scientific mi uh, uh, missions in the University of Lisbon in Portugal. And I'm in the Arctic Youth Network members since last year. So first, we're going to start with, uh, with uh, uh, Petur Halderson. Uh, let me just introduce real quick Petur. Uh, Petur is... Um, a biologist. Uh, he's a biologist who has a postgrad uh, degree in public administration uh, at the University of Iceland. Uh, he participated in early developments of the uh, Arctic Youth Network and the Arctic, the, the working group Arctic Youth Oceans. He has a background in environmental non-government organization, and that includes uh, three different organizations: the Ic Icelandic Youth Environmental Association. Icelandic Environment Association and WWF Global Arctic Program. Uh, his main experience and interest is, in, uh, is uh, relating to advocacy for the environment and youth empowerment. And he's the, one of the authors, so co-author of really interesting handbook and that's a handbook for environmental advocacy. So Petur, you have the stage and good luck. Thank you, Philip, and nice to be with all of you today. So I'm just going to, as an introduction, tell you a little bit about the Arctic Youth Network and its working group, uh, the Arctic Youth Network or AYN Oceans Working Group or AYO. <laughs> so we have a lot of abbreviations. So I'm just going to tell you about a little bit about, you know, why the AYO was created, which happened just recently this winter. Um, which should set the stage for the following presentations. So next slide, please. Yeah, so basically my background initially in environmental advocacy was, was with the Icelandic Youth Environmentalist Association, which is a national level environmental advocacy NGO in Iceland. And basically, I, for almost random reasons, attended the IGC2. And like you saw in Nicola's presentation uh, before, you know, it's almost at the very end of the long process, which has been going on for many years. Uh, so in 2019, I was present actually 
Uh, I had been working a little bit with Greenpeace Nordic, uh, so I was with them, and, in, and you can see on the picture, and you can see the red circle where I was sitting in, the, you know, where the observers can watch the ongoing negotiations. Uh, and basically, I then realized I was literally the only youth representative in the room, uh, even though there were young experts uh, here and there. And I tried, you know, running around grabbing all the young people I saw and talking with them. Uh, and that's just a picture I took of my face when I realized this, because Iceland is a small island, you know, small country with few people. And this huge process was just about to end after, you know, 20, 30 years. And there wasn't any youth representation. So next slide, please. So luckily, I had been involved with the Arctic Youth Network, which was initially founded to solve this kind of issue, well, in the Arctic and I guess globally of, you know, young people wanting to collaborate with other young people in other regions and really know what's going on. Because, uh, you know, if a group in Iceland uh, and a group from Alaska meet, for example, it's hard to know, you know, really what's going on. Uh, so after that, you know, organization had been building its capacity and, you know, connections and you could say the regional components of working across uh, cultural and linguistic boundaries. Uh, I approached them with this idea, okay, what if we have a topic uh, working group um, and we might, you know, start with this ocean thing because there's this huge BBNJ thing going on. And even though, you know, they weren't entirely clear what this BPNT thing was. They realized it was really important. Uh, next slide, please. And, and just to give you a brief intro to the AYN, uh, you know, it has a you know, members group. Uh, it has a project called the Exchange to help you know, young people produce their content and get it out there. And there are national chapters. And then um, we have these working groups, which include the AYO. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so just to show you here kind of the structure, because last fall we started advertising, okay, we're going to have a working group, it's going to be about the oceans, and it's not going to be only about the Arctic, but also the global context because of the, well, because of the urgency for the BPNJ, and, uh, and you can see how we, you know, needed to have facilitators and social butterflies who kind of keep uh, things going uh, and to take care of the practical things like, for example, how we're organizing a summit like this and the social butterflies to keep everyone, you know, uh, happy and motivated. And then below you can see the, in the center, you can see there, you could say production lines of the reconnaissance team looking into the BPNJ studying it. And then the graphic designers will be launching a website with this kind of information and the communicators, you know, to make sure that that, that content and website reaches the right audiences. And here you can actually see something brilliant that was created uh, very recently by uh, Philip himself and, and, and Laura in the AYO. Uh, so the AYO created these four logos to um, um, represent the four main pillars of the BPNJ negotiations. So anyway, I think that's enough for me, but the main purpose of this was to create, provide the space for young people to uh, dive into a topic like this and, and make, you know, some youth friendly content about it. Uh, and that's going to be made available on the AYO webpage, which should or might even be already ready. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so the next presenter will be Mana Tugend. Uh, she holds a, a LLM in poor law from University uh, of Akari in Iceland. Uh, she actually wrote her master's the, uh, th thesis on the rights of indigenous people and the establishment of marine protected areas, uh, uh, with emphasis on Canada and Greenland. Uh, she is currently working on marine plastic pollution at the North Atlantic Marine Mammal Commission in Tromso in uh, North uh, Norway, and also doing a, a research at the Norwegian Center for the Law of the Sea. Uh, on different aspects for BBNJ uh, negotiations. So she's going to a little bit introduce us to uh, AYO uh, and uh, uh, BBNJ. Manon? Yes, thank you for this introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, 
before I start my presentation, I want to emphasize that it's really an honor and pleasure to be with you today at the Global Youth Summit, although virtually, and uh, to have the opportunity to elaborate on the work we have accomplished um, at the Arctic Youth Network Oceans Group, or AYO, in relation to the ongoing BBNG. Uh, next slide, please. So following Peter's presentation of the AYO and how it came about, um, there are simply a few, a few things that I want to highlight with respect to our work. Uh, the first one would be that the AYO is uh, intended to be an open and transparent long-term platform for members of the Arctic Youth Network across the Arctic and beyond. Uh, with the aim to discuss and collaborate on oceans relevant topics. And importantly, I really want to highlight that the AYO is not doing any advocacy as such, but uh, rather our work is to pro provide reliable information to young people for them to rely on and then use uh, should they be interested in doing advocacy work. But uh, despite the, the platform or the AYO being uh, created to tackle all ocean relevant topics. It was deemed important to launch the group with an emphasis on a specific and significant uh, task in order to focus its early development and establish effective and inclusive internal uh, structures. And um, after having talked a bit, uh, I think we rapidly uh, agreed that uh, it was uh, important to focus on the BBNJ. I mean, what better topic than the BBNJ negotiations, which are such, such an important one and uh, such an urgent one to address to get us started. Uh, next slide, please. So as uh, Pietur mentioned in his presentation and uh, Nicola uh, before, there has not been any meaningful engagement of youth in the BBNJ process so far. The main barrier being probably its, lar its large scope and the complexity of these negotiations. So facing the urgency of the situation and knowing that the BBNJ process is scheduled to conclude in the fall of this year, the AYO has been tasked with studying its process and making it more accessible to young people. It is um, also, I think, an opportunity for us, for the AYO, to keep the momentum going and uh, increase the awareness about the BBNJ because I think still today when I tell some people that I'm working on BBNJ, they don't even know what it is and that a global agreement is being negotiated for the state of our ocean. Um, but um, importantly, I also want to emphasize that the AYO is not going to be only about the BBNJ process and that um, this uh, is the first topic that we are addressing. So once the negotiations are over and the agreement has been concluded and it's going to be a meaningful one, hopefully, um, the AYO will continue its crucial role of making knowledge, of creating knowledge and making it more widely accessible for youth or for knowledge to be more youth friendly and uh, focused in on other relevant uh, topics. Um, we would have to discuss that among us, but uh, as you heard during the first sessions, there are many, many topics that are still uh, worth uh, being discussed and uh, tackled uh, for uh, protecting our, our ocean. Um, yeah, so we have heard in the first half of this session how urgent the situation is for our ocean and how crucial it is for youth to be included and empowered in high seas governance. Um, but I think they need to be given the tools to do so. And this is what we wanted to achieve through the AYO. So we have dug into the four pillars that uh, Nicola presented before and that we will present uh, in a short time and try to make them more digestible for youth and the general public. So yeah, that's it for me. I'm now happy to give the floor to our amazing uh, team members at DAYO, Rachel, Manon, Katerina, and Bryden to take you a bit more through what we have accomplished. Thank you. Thank you, Mana. So like Mana said, we're going to dive into some of the issues in the negotiations for the BBNJ. And uh, we're going to have four presenters uh, presenting that. The first of them is uh, Rachel Sullivan-Lord. 
Uh, she's uh, a marine biologist. Uh, she, is, she is a grad student at the Simon Fraser, uh, currently studying recovering baleen whales in Northwest Atlantic. And she has been doing that for the 10 years. Um, she's also, it's really interesting that she's also an expedition guide in the polar regions. And that's a really cool job to have. Uh, so uh, yes, Rachel, uh, so you're, she's gonna talk about uh, uh, she's going to talk about the marine um, uh, marine genetic resources. Thanks very much, Philip. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. It's really great to be able to share with um, people that I've never met in person, but I've been working with for months now on this process, uh, some of the, the work that we've put out. So like Philip said, I am a marine biologist, but I will admit that um, November of last year was really the first that I'd heard about the BBNJ agreement when um, Peter and some of the other organizers of the AYO put out a call of interest to people um, who wanted to join this working group to create this material. So um, I, I don't study the high seas um, or organisms in the, in the deep ocean. I study charismatic megafauna um, that are typically in the, the more shallow coastal regions. Although a lot of those species as well, we've talked about before and I'll mention um, share different uh, ocean zones, of course, going between areas beyond national jurisdiction and territorial waters. Um, so yeah, I think it, it speaks to even if uh, you're in marine science um, or studying part of the planet that does relate to this agreement that's been going on for the last 20 years or so, um, you might not have heard of it. So it's definitely a wake up call to me. And um, yeah, hopefully the information that we provide can be a little more interdisciplinary and provide information that makes it easier. The biggest takeaway that I've gained from all of this research is that this process um, is extremely complicated. And I am in awe of the many individuals that have devoted their entire careers, their entire graduate school careers to this process. Um, and it's, it's really amazing. And uh, it's amazing to be able to read decades of work um, that is quite a stack to go through to really understand this. So we're gonna, I'll, I'll talk, I'll give a brief introduction to just what marine genetic resources are and as they relate to the negotiations. And then I'm really gonna focus on what we're calling a hot potato issue regarding this element of the negotiations. So we've kind of identified these really, um, as Peter called them, sticky, icky issues or sticky wicket issues that are, are points of contention, really challenging uh, things that need to be worked through for the negotiations and, and into the draft text. So just for a brief introduction, um, marine genetic resources are one of the four main elements of the BBNJ negotiations. And the goal overall for uh, this international agreement is to sustainably and equitably use, but also protect these resources. And so you can kind of imagine how that already sets up a contention between using and protecting. Um, of course, there's many examples of that is possible and that can be done, um, but it's really tricky and, and you have to do it carefully. So that's the overall goal. Um, there's uh, in areas beyond national jurisdiction, the high seas, there's two different ocean zones that marine genetic resources can be in, both the water column, uh, like the squid photographed here, and also organisms that are attached to the substrate or the bottom. Although it's not necessarily always the bottom as we've um, heard mentioned previously, you can have seamounts that are taller than many mountain ranges uh, in our terrestrial environment. And so sometimes the, the substrate can be much closer to the ocean surface. So you have free swimming organisms and you have life forms that are attached to a part of the ocean floor. And um, one important thing that I wanna mention is that a lot of these organisms don't fit into political boundaries and a lot of political boundaries don't fit to biological needs. So that's another kind of underlying um, tension. Next slide, please. So these marine genetic resources um, are, you can think of this as any life in the high seas, 
life or forms of life that contain functional units of heredity. So basically genes. So it's not just whole entire organisms, uh, although it can be, and it can especially be something like a raw extract from those organisms. Think of something like fish uh, oil or krill oil, um, but can also just be the DNA or RNA from an organism or a compound that that organism produces that you extract from it and then can be used. You don't have to continue going back to that deep sea site to retain it if you've collected it once sometimes. And these marine genetic resources have uh, value, as we've heard previously, there's both scientific and commercial value, and there's a lot of overlap between scientific and commercial value. So in terms of scientific value, uh, a lot of the organisms found in the high seas have a long history of life on the planet. Um, so in importance to evolutionary biology just overall. Um, and then there's also, as we've heard, lots of undiscovered life forms. And most dives are, it's not unusual to discover multiple new species in a single dive going to um, these unexplored, relatively little unexplored areas of our planet. And of course, there's the general um, value contributing to planetary biodiversity. And there's unique life forms found in the ocean that are not found in terrestrial environments. And commercial values, I just, there's lots of different applications, but I want to highlight um, chemicals that are produced by organisms such as sponges and corals, as you can see in this photograph here. So sponges and corals that are attached uh, to the substrate, they can't move. And so to protect themselves from either uh, pathogens or predators, uh, these creatures have developed chemicals that protect them as they stay in place. And a lot of these chemicals inhibit the, um, the multiplication of cells and the dividing of cells of other organisms. And so you can think about how that'd be really useful for an anti-cancer compound or treatment. And uh, many treatments for uh, different forms of cancer have come from particularly sponges um, and this, this kind of idea of organisms in the deep needing to protect themselves by keeping other cells away from them. So actually having these chemicals that can do that um, could have vast implications and already have had really important values to humanity itself. Uh, I mentioned scientific and commercial overlap um, quite a bit. And so, you know, a scientific discovery can then lead to commercial products. Um, commercial products need to use marine scientific resource to perhaps get the uh, compound of the organism in the first place. And so it can get murky and difficult to distinguish those two. There's also actual value, known value. Um, so compounds that have already been discovered, but there's a lot of potential. So we've already hammered about this point that there's a lot of undiscovered life forms, particularly in the deep waters, particularly in the high seas. And we know enough to know that um, there is more life to be discovered out there and likely that life could have really important uh, implications for and uses for humanity. So even though we don't know what's there, we have a pretty good idea of what could be there. Um, and so this idea of potential but unknown value is underlying marine genetic resources and the negotiations based on that. Go to the next slide. Just as a quick example of um, how much there's still more to discover. So I came across this beautiful photograph from the logs of an expedition in 2019 to uh, the deep, deep waters off the southeastern coast of North America. Um, so this was just a couple years ago, and this is a crinoid. Um, and I, as a person who studies marine uh, charismatic megafauna, I've, I've tried really hard to make an effort to not just think about the large baleen whales um, and their direct food sources that I study, but also the other forms of life in the ocean that are all interconnected. Um, but I had never heard of a crinoid before. And so going through these photographs and I did a deep dive into that. And these are essentially living fossils. A lot of organisms in the fossil record, we don't have living uh, organisms to study at the same time as their fossils. But these crinoids, there's over 600 uh, living species of these crinoids, but they appeared on our planet 300 million years before the dinosaurs. 
So they've been here for ages. They're a substantial part of our fossil record. And there's also living species of these organisms. This photograph taken in 2019, um, this, they, there were multiple of the same species in the water column uh, swimming. They collected one. The only other specimen of the species was collected in 1963, and it wasn't even fully intact. So um, huge discovery. And this was potentially the first time the species has been observed swimming. And crinoids uh, can sometimes the juvenile life stages swim, sometimes the adult life stages swim. Um, and, and so this was the first time potentially, unless there's someone else out there that knows uh, that the species has been observed swimming before, but really amazing discovery. And um, just wanna highlight a lot of deep sea expeditions have um, really good scientific outreach and videos and photo logs that you can go through and, and see some of the things that they've observed. So an example of, of uh, how often new discoveries are made on just about every deep dive you go down into or every time you visit depths of the high seas. Next slide, please. So again, underlying these BBNJ negotiations are uh, not knowing everything that's living in the high seas, but having a good idea of what could be there and knowing that there is still so much to discover. And uh, we want to hopefully not lose those species before we even discover them and known to science. So this leads to these hot potato issues of these points of contention um, or sticking points in the negotiations. And there's uh, several really important ones that relate to marine genetic resources, but I wanna focus on this uh, tension between the freedom of the high seas principle and the common heritage of mankind principle. Um, so these are stated in the Convention on the Law of the Sea from 1982, but they're referring to some parts of the high seas, not all. And uh, some certain nations have taken either one of these principles as what should be the guiding basis for um, how to access and how to share benefits from marine genetic resources. And because they, uh, nations have taken their, uh, these, these principles are often representing directly opposing views and ideas. So oftentimes nations are, are using the freedom of the high seas principle uh, to support that individual interests should be prioritized regarding living resources in the high seas. Um, and one of the arguments is that collecting marine genetic resources always starts from a scientific perspective or, or point. This is what some nations uh, say. And uh, the Convention on the Law of the Sea specifically gives freedom of marine scientific research in the high seas. So this is one uh, way that some nations, typically uh, developed nations that have a lot of capacity to access these resources are saying this should be the underlying um, mechanism and an extreme viewpoint taken from that principle would be that there's no regulation of access to life forms in the high seas and uh, no necessary benefit sharing. So that's one extreme viewpoint. The other extreme viewpoint in opposition is taking the principle of common heritage of the mankind as uh, the underlying basis, which prioritizes the group interests. So these are, um, yeah, it's a, a shared resource for all and should be managed as a group resource. Uh, these principles aren't stated in the current draft text of the treaty negotiations, um, perhaps in an effort to kind of get beyond these principles that have been taken from um, the agreement in 1982 and uh, used to support views now in relation to the BBNJ negotiations. Um, but what seems to be happening is that this hot potato has cooled maybe a little bit. However, not including these principles directly explicitly stated in the draft text um, has ruffled some feathers in certain nations that feel that this is uh, a main issue that needs to be included um, from their viewpoints. And uh, so what, what seems to be working is that identifying areas of common interest and in ground in terms of specifically thinking about how or if access um, should, be, should be regulated or not and how benefit sharing should happen. 
uh, these common areas of interest seem to be what is guiding slow movement forward on this. But um, you can go to the next slide, Philip, this contention um, is still very much present in uh, the current negotiations as we go into the, the 11th hour and the final rounds. So it brings up some of these questions, particularly defining the exact resources. And again, there's a lot of biological challenges because a lot of organisms move between zones uh, at different stages of their life or from time scales of days to years. Uh, so it makes it really, really challenging. Um, but these marine genetic resources, you can go to the next slide, Philip, form the basis for the rest of the other elements in terms of what's actually being discussed. So it leads into um, our next speaker. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so our next speaker is, uh, she's going to talk about area-based management tools. She, she, her name is Manon Sassol. Uh, she's actually graduated from, with a master's degree in European law uh, and comparative law, uh, specializing in human rights, uh, working in those domains uh, for quite some time uh, for some non-government organization, organizations and public sector. Uh, she also volunteered for the French German Youth Office, where she worked on a project uh, that is related to ecocide. Uh, after doing that volunteering, she decided to shift to marine species, and now she's doing her master's degree at the University of Montreal and the University of Hamburg. So, um, it, Manon, your, your, the stage is yours. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, first of all, I would like to say that please uh, do not hesitate to post questions at the end of the session, um, namely because if there are any misunderstanding because of my um, English. So um, let me start by presenting the um, area-based management tools, including marine protected uh, areas. So uh, I have some uh, difficulty difficulties uh, to say uh, A, B, and T's. Uh, so I will say instead tools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so why it's important to talk about this matter? Uh, in fact, these tools are a way to protect uh, some areas in the ocean. And um, as you may have noticed, uh, species are under threat. And um, six percent, more than six percent of the ocean are uh, protected, whereas forty percent of the ocean have been altered by human activities. Um, as you can see on the map, um, you have a dark blue and a pink zone. It's quite small, but you can see that. Um, that represents the uh, marine, uh, the uh, protected areas. Next slide, please. Um, so the main problem is to find uh, compatibility between states. In other words, it means that at the national level, it's quite, um, it's not easy, but it's easier to create um, protected areas in the sense that states have uh, their own uh, way to measure to uh, create uh, these areas. Um, however, when it comes to the international waters, uh, several um, interests from different states uh, come into the table and it's quite difficult to find um, a compatibility. Um, the main objective is to uh, find a conciliation between human activities and the protection of biodiversity. Next slide, please. So um, two, um, two hot potatoes uh, could be highlighted. The first one is uh, related to the identification of these tools, and the second one uh, is related to the mechanism. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, there is no universal definition regarding M, B, and T's. However, we can find um, a definition at the Article 1, Paragraph 3 of the draft text. 
And if you uh, read through this um, text, you can uh, notice some vague uh, notion, uh, terms, um, words, expression. Um, for instance, several sectors or activities, and um, it posed some question, which activities, which sectors, um, are they cumulative? Should we avoid them? Um, what we can think it's about uh, mining, fishing, etc. Next slide, please. Um, the article 16 of the draft te text is quite uh, contentious um, in the sense, so it's related to the identification of the tools. Uh, for three, um, we can um, underline three, um, three uh, problems. The first one is related to the Annex 1, which um, lists some crit criteria um, to identify the, the tools. Um, we could ask if these um, criteria are cumulative or not. The second question is, um, if the tools and BMTs uh, do, uh, they include a cumulative uh, impact uh, across ecological, spatial, and temporal scales. And the last uh, question, it's related to the Convention on Biological Diversity. And this convention mentioned um, the, another tool called Other Effective Area-Based uh, Conservation Measure. And um, we could wonder if uh, this, the MBNTs include also these measures. Next slide, please. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, hot potatoes uh, related to the mechanism. Um, we could ask what is the role of the coastal states? Um, in other words, we have the international waters and surround we have um, mari marine territories, uh, which uh, fall under the jurisdiction or the sovereignty of the coastal states. And should, should the coastal state have a more rights or should they have, um, um, should they give, um, yeah, um, should they have more rights uh, to uh, identify the tools? And the last question is there is there any authority that controls the implementation of uh, the tools? So um, I would like to leave you with uh, this thought um, and to put you in, in a more concrete um, situation and to highlight the problem with this, uh, this uh, question of identifying um, MBNTs. Let's imagine you are um, a dolphin or a whale and uh, you, you, you are swimming in the, in the ocean. And do you think you know where are the borders um, between international waters and national uh, waters? And do you, do, do you think you will know where are the, the zone where are more dangerous for you or uh, less dangerous? This kind of question is the main problem to know if the protected areas will be just focused on fishing or on mining or both, for instance, or other human activities. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Madame. Um, please do write your comments about being a whale or a dolphin and what do you think about it in the, in the, in the chat room and ask any questions anytime regarding any of the presentation. Uh, we will answer all the questions later at the end. Uh, so thank you again, Manon. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, the next presentation uh, is regarding environmental uh, impact assessment. Uh, and uh, Katarina Heinrich will present that. Uh, she's, uh, she's cu currently living in, in Iceland for quite some time and uh, she has a master's degree in polar law and at the moment uh, pursuing the master's degree in coastal and marine management. 
her, uh, her main research in interest uh, is marine biodiversity conservation and management as environmental as well as environmental law, especially regarding the polar regions. Uh, for her thesis in polar law, she investigated the implication of the current BBNJ process for the Antarctic uh, Treaty area. And uh, she was focusing uh, particularly on the issue of biological prospecting activities. Uh, she's right now doing the internship at the climate office at the Alfred Wegener Institute. And just recently, she became the research assistant uh, on the project for PCRC in Kobe. Uh, so um, she's gonna, like I said, she's gonna talk about environmental uh, impact assessment, Katarina. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I've been looking into environmental impact assessments within the BBNJ negotiations, actually together with Philip, um, and also, of course, with the support of everyone else um, in the AYO. And um, yes, so as we all have heard um, before, also today, um, the marine areas are getting busier and busier and increased interest and the need for natural resources and also the opening of the polar regions, for example, contribute to that. And activities and developments which are conducted in, these, in this marine environment um, can potentially um, have beneficial or adverse impacts. So in order to identify these impacts, environmental impact assessments serve as a common tool. Um, so environmental impact assessments are the process of identifying, predicting, and evaluating possible impacts of proposed projects and developments, and thereby interrelated socioeconomic, cultural, and human health impacts are taken into account. So these can be, as I already said, um, be both beneficial or adverse impacts. Um, next slide, please. Um, so on the national level, the process of environmental impact assessments is well established. Um, however, this is not the case for areas beyond national jurisdiction. And we also have heard that be, uh, today before, um, that the regulatory framework is um, highly fragmented and also on, um, for environmental impact assessment in the high seas, that is true. And different requirements only apply in specific regions. So with the increased environmental consciousness, um, the need for environmental impact assessments as a tool to identify these impacts um, of developments and projects um, in the high seas uh, was recognized. And as such, um, the EIA um, discussion became an essential part and one of the four package elements of the BBNJ negotiation. Um, but these discussions on the specifics of the EIA process in the high seas uh, include also various challenges. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we have been looking into that um, a little bit and I want to just um, briefly elaborate on these. Um, and then also, of course, um, like um, Mana and Peter also mentioned, already, uh, you can access this information then also through our web page. Um, so the main issues during the negotiations are the all of all over scope of the environmental impact assessment provision and what um, impact should be considered, as well as the special role of adjacent coastal states. Um, so there is disagreement between the states or there has been dis or disagreement between the states arose um, on whether the EIA process should include socioeconomic factors or whether the EIA process should solely focus on impact on the natural and physical environment. Um, so it has been argued that with the inclusion of socioeconomic factors, the EIA process um, without the assessment would be too broad. And if an agreement on the issue even would be uh, would be reached, like even if it would be reached, um, the definition and the exact uh, identification of these socioeconomic factors would also present an additional hurdle in the establishment of the EIA requirements. Um, so we see that this is like a really complex issue with like lots of um, perspectives on view and views on it, um, which are discussed in the um, 
uh, negotiations. A further issue um, included in the negotiations um, is referring to the adjacent coastal states and whether they should be involved within the EIA process itself or through having, for example, a role regarding the approval of the proposed activity. Um, this agreement on the issue remains and it will be it will need to be seen if a compromise can be made within the negotiations. But of course, everyone is aiming for compromises, but it is always difficult when a lot of states are involved with different um, interests, perspectives and backgrounds. Um, and lastly, I'd also like to point out that the implementation of stricter standards and thresholds for the EIA process includes further disagreements between the states, um, diverging opinions between the states are expressed, um, whether a tiered approach should be targeted regarding thresholds for the EIA process. Um, the negotiations on the details of the EIA process in ABNJ can be defined as highly technical and broad. So that is of course, um, an overall issue for um, these um, um, meetings and negotiations, uh, which uh, makes them really complex. Um, but as said, general agreement exists that the establishment of a comprehensive regime regarding the AI process, and also of course the other pillars um, for um, the high seas needs to be achieved as far as possible. Um, so that was it from my side so far, um, and I would like to um, hand the mic back to Philip. <laughs> Thank you, Katarina. Uh, that was a good explanation. Uh, and now, at last, last but not least, uh, it's Brian Rubone. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the fourth and final uh, element or pillar. It's that's a capacity building and transfer of marine technology. Just want to give you a short uh, intro about Brian. Uh, he's a marine conservation biologist. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree of science at the University of Manitoba. Um, he did his master of marine manage management degree. Uh, so he's interested mostly in Arctic issues and uh, that came from his master project. Uh, uh, to which he did uh, a marine protected area network in the Eastern Canadian Arctic and uh, forecasted future threats to the network's integrity. Uh, right now, he currently works uh, for the Canadian federal government, uh, planning, establishing and managing uh, marine protected areas. So Bryden, it's, it's your stage. Thank you very much, Philip. And thanks to everyone that joined us today. It's been a great uh, group of people discussing a bunch of different issues. So I'll be talking about the fourth pillar or fourth element of the package of the BB&J agreement, capacity building and transfer of marine technology. So this builds on existing mandates, including in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, as well as guidance from the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for the sharing of technology and expertise towards sustainable ocean use. So using the high seas and doing it in a responsible way. Now, why is this important? Uh, well, ocean science is incredibly expensive and it can take years to develop that requisite individual state level and institutional expertise so that you can do this properly. Uh, so if states can leverage existing technology and knowledge and use that technology knowledge responsibly, the area beyond national jurisdiction can be more sustainably managed uh, and on a, a more accelerated timeline than if states were to do this individually. So things like creating MPAs, undertaking those impact assessments and collecting processing and analyzing marine genetic resources, all these things require capacity. So this final section supports uh, the three previous pillars that were just discussed. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the hot potato here, uh, it's fairly simple and similar debates were had during unclosed negotiations, but uh, in theory, every state supports the building of capacity so that developing countries are able to build a sustainable blue economy, as well as uh, support the responsible stewardship of the area beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, yet when a state envisions themselves being on the giving end of this equation, they can be a bit more reluctant. Uh, so you can see a couple illustrative examples um, in different perspectives here. 
from, from two different groups. So generally it's divided amongst developed versus developing states. But on the top, we have an example of a written submission from uh, the European Union and member states. And the quotation there is technology transfer should be carried out on a voluntary basis with that emphasis on voluntary. And then you can contrast that with the statement at the bottom from uh, the 12 Pacific Small Island developing states, uh, which says that proponents of marine genetic resources related activities could be required to transfer specific technology. So this just a, a different in, in perspective on, on, the, on the obligations that would be outlined uh, pertaining to the three previous pillars in the draft text. We can go to the next slide, please. So why is this wording being debated so strongly? Um, for the sake of the short overview, we can just discuss a couple main aspects that make up the contentious issue of this pillar. Uh, and those could be where the funding is going to come from, as well as how intellectual property rights will and can be respected. So we can go to the next slide and we'll start with funding. As I mentioned, ocean science is very expensive and we have a, a number of people on here on this call today that, that deal with it so they can attest to that, but building a, a national program, just operating under one set of rules and in a confined space is hard enough, but to do it in uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction will be decidedly more expensive. And some states are starting from a place of limited existing resources. Uh, so for this reason, funding is, is integral here to support capacity building and technology transfer. Uh, so the first poll that we have up here, we've got the a clearinghouse. Uh, there is currently wording around a clearinghouse in the draft text. Uh, this is simply an institution or a body that connects those that have a technology or a piece of knowledge with those that would like to use it. So it's a repository of sorts, a networking facilitator. But staffing, IT headquarters, all these things will require funds. Uh, the second bullet here, we've got implementing the institutional structure. So this includes the clearinghouse. Um, but it also structures and processes at the state level, like a new branch of a government department that would have to deal with this, or at the institutional level, like a university or a college, as well as increase in the expertise of those that would populate those structures that were uh, created, such as filling those research or management positions. And then we also have things like initial partnerships or initial research or analysis activities. Um, it's unlikely that even with a blueprint or a completed protocol that some states would have the requisite capacity to be able to build or implement these things. So states with capacity would likely fund projects and, and include a state um, or an institution with less capacity as a partner so they can gain some of that firsthand experience and skills and some of that knowledge. Uh, this would then increase their ability to be able to independently implement these activities in the future. But again, the majority of funding, at least initially, would likely come from that, uh, that state that does have that capacity. We can go to the next slide here. So the second aspect is less straightforward than funding. Um, it's often not even settled completely in one state's context, let alone internationally. Uh, we can think about things uh, like the non-fungible tokens, which have been, uh, been talked about a lot lately, but um, online and, and digital content and how it's dealt with is, is quite complex and, and is, always, um, is always evolving. That's what I'm looking for. Now, so I'm not an expert here, but I, I do understand some of the questions, uh, such as how can obligations under this pillar of the BB&G agreement be fulfilled while maintaining an individual's or an organization's intellectual property rights? So putting that another way, if a company creates a technology and they maintain the rights and the ability to profit from that technology, how can this then be transferred to a requesting state while ensuring it doesn't infringe on those initial rights? So this is relevant for um, things that you would think of traditionally under intellectual property rights, such as those patents and those protocols, uh, but also for emerging things, as Rachel talked about earlier, uh, those marine genetic resources, some genetic sequences that could be used to uh, synthesize a protein or a molecule that then would have an application in, uh, in the medical field, for example. And we can go to the final slide here, Philip, please. 
So building a robust system for marine research in the area beyond national jurisdiction, again, looking at this map, that entire area in dark blue there, it's going to be expensive and, and it will require technological advancements, uh, but this will be made easier if we can build on existing work and, and share that among states. So once again, the issue that certain states are, are seeing a difference in contributions, uh, no one state alone will be able to properly address the sustainable use of biodiversity in this dark blue area here. Uh, the only way that this can reasonably be done on a, a timeline that's appropriate, considering all the threats that we face, is by pooling resources among parties. And the fourth pillar is uh, attempting to provide a framework to ensure that this happens in a, uh, in a timely manner. And I'll leave it there. We don't have much time left for questions, but uh, I'll I'll toss it back to you, Philip. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. Um, so I wanna thank to all presenters. Uh, I hope that they gave you some valuable information about the uh, organization and also about all the hot potatoes that we're dealing with uh, regarding negotiations, BBNJ. And um, uh, of course, there's a lot more of those hot potatoes of those issues, uh, but uh, you know we're gonna keep working on them. Uh, I just want to point out uh, something is that uh, AYN uh, has a, a separate uh, website, uh, web page. Uh, it's called oceans.ayn.link and you have it right now in the chat. Uh, it's gonna it's not it's gonna be launched later this week, so it's still under construction. But afterwards, uh, you're gonna be able to uh, um, you're gonna be able to see a little bit more about our, our about our subgroup and um, and to uh, to actually uh, see more about what we do and how we do it. But still, no matter uh, the web web page is not on, we're still working on the BBNJ and all the hot potatoes, hot issues uh, and negotiations. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, one question. Um, let me just see. Yeah, uh, in terms of BBNJ and legal protection, is there a possibility for legal, legal personhood for oceans? Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure which one which one of you want to take this questions. Uh, so it's it's regarding the law and it's regarding the legal uh, personhood for the oceans. Does anybody feel com comfortable enough to take this one? I'm happy to say a little something, Philip, if you'd like, but happy for for your panelists to speak first, please. Okay, you, you can you can say it, Nicole. Thanks. So um, yeah, and I, I shared this in the slide. Um, I think that's a really great question that that Daphne asked. Um, and to say it's it's a sort of new idea that that sort of a couple of researchers are starting to think about. Um, and so I shared within the link. Um, there's a really interesting paper paper uh, by a friend of mine, Harriet Hardin Davies. Um, and a couple of others who have been thinking about rights for nature um, as a potential lens to, to do that. So um, the, the paper does a much better, better and more eloquent job of, of responding to that question, but would, would encourage people to, if you're interested in this question, to take a look through the paper. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I'm sure if, if you're interested in talking more, happy to connect you with the, the lead author on that. Okay, we have another question. Uh, the question is from Marie. Uh, she asks, can states not participating in new clause can participate in the BBNJ? So who wants to answer this one? Again, I'm happy to, but we'll defer to your panelists first. Yeah, I could also jump in on this. All right, Sebastian, would you say it? Because Nicole already answered the question, so she will not answer it. Sure, and Nicola might have more to add here, but states that are non-parties to the uh, UNCLOS, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, can participate and are participating 
in the negotiations for the BBNJ agreement. Their status as a non-party to own clause um, in some cases affects the position that they take in the BBNJ agreement negotiations, but there's uh, nothing stopping them from engaging in those negotiations and potentially once there is a final treaty becoming a party to the BBNJ agreement without being a party to own clause. Uh, Nicola, did I miss anything? No, you got it. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, all countries um, are open to to negotiate, to take part of the negotiations. And indeed, a number of non-parties of UNCLOS are, are actively engaging, like the United States, um, as, a, as a notable example. Um, but yes, um, so yeah, but Sebastian, you, you nailed it. Okay, as, as far as we are on UNCLOS, uh, um, one question for, for uh, Katarina is uh, uh, regarding the EAI, EIA uh, process. So is there any pre-existing provision in the UN clause on the, on the environmental impact process you know, that could be incorporated or is incorporated negotiation treaty? Um, yes, yeah, so um, basically, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, if there's something which uh, doesn't um, uh, cover it, Perfectly, but um, so in the draft ag agreement, um, which was um, in the uh, prepared uh, in preparation of the third substantial session, and also discussed during the session, refers to Article two hundred four to two hundred six in the UNCLOS within the EIA provisions. Um, but um, Article 206 does not specifically refer to an EIA process, but creates the general obligation to assess potential effects of, for, of activities. So it is not specifically said environmental impact assessment per se, but of course um, the general obligation to um, assess the potential effects, which can be basically, um, um, I'm lacking the word, uh, which can be basically um, seen as like EIA process um, is included in that. Um, yeah, and then also there is a provision in the draft agreement which regulates the um, High Seas Treaty um, and the relationship between the agreement with um, other relevant legal instruments. So it dates back directly um, also or like refers directly to other instruments too. Um, so basically, um, so yes, there is um, pre-existing provisions in the UNCLOS um, existing, even though it's not per se said in these words, like environmental impact assessment. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. And just one more question uh, that actually we get a lot and uh, I would like if Petur can uh, answer that one. Uh, so, uh, the question is, why is the Arctic Youth Network doing the, the project on the global uh, uh, BBNJ? Thank you. And that, that's a really good question and kind of relates to how the Arctic Youth Network or AYN was itself founded uh, because the whole organization started when a group from Iceland and a group from Alaska met each other and and already there are, you know, internationally uh, youth-led platforms uh, like Yonko at the Climate Negotiations and the Global Youth Biodiversity Network at the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, and even though these are some of the bigger international youth-led platforms, uh, they are centered on specific issues. Uh, and with the Arctic, there are so many, you know, issues, you know, relating to colonization and culture and and we felt it was really important to get a platform that was entirely open-ended. So whatever young people want to work on, whether it's these individual tasks or things, you know, the environment or combining that with the cultural aspect. Uh, and then when we created the Oceans Working Group, uh, we kind of had the same concept happening because uh, we didn't know of any international group focusing on the BPNJ or oceans in general. There are these regional, uh, groups like with the European Union and so on. Uh, so basically, we got just kind of continued the concept of the Arctic Youth Network that yes, it's kind of is the Arctic Youth Network, but also the global Arctic Youth Network. Like people say, uh, nothing in the Arctic stays in the Arctic, or you could, you know, uh, apply that to the oceans. You know, the oceans are 
you know, they produce the rain for the entire planet and it's all this uh, huge uh, interconnected system. Okay. Okay, thank you, Petur. I think that's all for, for today. You can see on your screen still shared uh, the website of the Arctic Youth Network and Petur was uh, also uh, sharing uh, the contact in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for this interesting, um, uh, for this interesting session. Thank, thanks to High Seas Aliens as well and all the people from the first part of the, of the session. I hope you all had fun and you uh, learn something and you're going to contact all of us and uh, that we're going to have more engagement in youth as far as the uh, high seas and Arctic and BBNJ in, in, in general. Thank you all and I hope you have a good day.